So okay. foresight, if you could talk yeah. about the group first. Jimmy Green on saxophone, Aaron Rosner's piano, and Peyton Cosby on drums. Originally, this group set out to be a quartet of percussion, piano, bass, and drums. And uh, that led, that went the way of good bands. We decided, I decided I want to try something else. And uh, Jimmy Green was recommended to me. I had never heard him play. I knew who he was. And uh, I heard him had a record of, on, on my computer, had a record on him, and he sound such an interesting person and to play who would seem to me to be aware of playing with the band not instead of the band or not in spite of the band yeah and uh, i've always liked irene's voicings when i've heard her play with her her groups around town so uh and peyton was the drummer of the original quartet so it seemed like a a nice change of that's not necessarily a change of pace because it's changing uh but the the, with the hornless quartet had gone as far as they could go yeah, I thought, and I thought that maybe we need somebody else to uh, bring a different tie, as it were, to the band. And and yeah. James, because that very well, he plays soprano and tenor, but with this band, he only plays tenor. Yeah, yeah. He writes well, he reads really well, he understands uh, that the bass player back to his plans and stuff to help him out if he allows it, and uh, I make sure he allows it, and he and I really have a good sense of of harmony, and he and Peyton fit the rhythm real nice like a glove. So it's a, a, a ideal quartet for me to do different kinds of things and change arrangements nightly as I feel the band needs. Yeah. Um, Irene, again, I've loved her playing for a very long time. She's a very good writer. Yeah. Uh, and Peyton has a wonderful time. When the beat starts off, it stays there until I get tired of hearing it. That's necessary. Absolutely. Um, and that kind of, you know, fits hand in glove with the, the way you approach your, your bass playing. You're obviously a beyond capable soloist, but you know, I mean, your, your role as, as a, as a rhythm section player, um, both, you know, within structures and being very loose as well, uh, is kind of something that's defined you, I think, uh, your career. Um, were there any kind of foundational philosophies with this group, any sort of, uh, roadmaps or guidelines when you first put it together? Well, I, th I think any bass player who wants to be the band leader of any group has to have a band leader. Band understand that he he or she is the leader. And once okay. that and once that step is in place, it's up to the band leader, the bass player in this case, to deliver. Whether that's an interesting library, whether setting the tone for the night with his, atti his or her attitude, yeah. whether deciding the tempos necessary and the keys they play them in. Yeah. Whether it's the order of the songs that they play, uh, whether the second set is not as good as the first set, his job is to figure out why that is. Uh, and once you find people who understand that this direction is coming yeah. from the physical back of the band, the bass player, uh, a good time can be had by all. If there aren't any <laughs> place, I can't imagine a band staying together more than 20, 20 choruses. I managed to get a hold of the album uh, since we first spoke a couple of days ago in high res, and it sounds spectacular. But um, you start your sets with uh, a medley of a few tunes, uh, as I understand it. Well, certainly on the album, and it seems to be what you do. And I guess maybe if you could talk a little bit about what's what's the is there like the purpose of of starting off with a, a, a series of tunes? First question is that you know you do these continuous openings of four yes. or five tunes. I call this my many my many suites. Yeah, and, and, and the reason that I do have a, I do in fact have a program in my head. We work at, we work a weekend at a place called like we work a weekend at um, Birdland. Yeah, I have I plan a set for the week. I make four copies, make five copies. Yeah, every one for the band and one for the sound guy. Yeah, and I have the songs picked out that I think we can. In an order that allows the set to build, depending on the order of the tunes I pick and, and the, the tempo and how long they are. I mean, all those factors always change every night, depending on how the band and each person feels. Sure. But I want them to come to work every night knowing what the challenge is. This is not a repertory band. I'm not trying to see how many tunes they know. Yeah. And they're trying to see how many I know. But I'm trying to see if they can pick up an idea from Tuesday night and knit it through the whole weekend so that by Saturday, they're in great shape. Yeah. Uh, so it's a mini suite. And I think that if I get it right, uh, the audience doesn't realize that they've been sitting in this small space or a space smaller than uh, the forum, 
Well, you, you know, uh, I, I never think, I never feel that this band is built for small rooms. Mm. I think this band is built for as many people we can get in the space. If the space is bigger, good for us. Yeah. And, and I use the small room analogy because uh, that was our last gig, basically. Yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, it's, a good, it's a good example for me of the music's correct. No matter how, how small the room is and how tight it is, people will feel the sense of not completion until I say it's completed. In a bigger room, there's so many other distractions, sizes and hundreds of people. And that's really important too for, for the financial survival of the band. You know? uh, but again, uh, I, I don't turn down the gate because the room is too big or too small. I don't believe that's possible with, with music. One of the things that struck me when I listened to the album was how, how broad the dynamics were um, from like really exhilarating energy to almost so quiet that I can almost imagine like the crowd having to lean forward in their seat to hear it. That's um, very necessary. Yeah, I th and, and I think that's, uh, feels, um, is, is that kind of intimacy is a little harder to attain in like a concert hall as opposed to a club maybe. Oh no 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 man! We've done two thousand seat halls with big yeah. spaces, and and, and uh, you know, with with the uh, one two three tiers like this around 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 the band, you yeah. know, and, and like the opera seats, and all kind of stuff, man. And and uh, it's a wonderful set. Actually, they had better sounding rooms than most clubs. Clearly, in their favor in terms of comparable sizes of rooms to play. Right. Yeah. Uh, those those size rooms. Always have great pianos. So, and, and, in any event, I don't work the environment. The, the size of the environment doesn't concern me at all. You know, that, that's a hard, hard, hard condition to quantify. Yeah. I like to think that musicians, whoever they are, understand the sonics of a room yeah. and may temper their general volume level to meet the accommodation of their arena, so to speak, in the broad terms. Uh, but I think that good players, they don't care whether the room is too big or small. They just want to get something going so the people who paid to be entertained, quote unquote entertained, have a chance of getting their money's worth because we're able to give them their money's worth. A group that's called, the, the, there's a, an event every year where certain record companies are selected by a group of person who makes these decisions that have record vinyl day. Okay, record store day, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this record store day decide at this time to only have certain companies make a limited amount of, of vinyl discs. Yeah. And they picked the company I'm with, in and out Records, to be the one of the, first, one of the groups whose job, who, who, whose, whose selection meant that they would press only 2,000 records. Yeah. They would all be numbered by hand and signed by the person to yeah. be issued on the, the special day that's been yeah. delayed because of the situation in the yeah. world. And with the stipulation that these records could not be put on sale to eBay until after a year has gone by. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. And since I'm in the band, I'm literally surrounded by the sound given the band. Uh, I never felt that I heard a, a recorded sound, a, a, a stereo, a go back away, hi-fi system that sounded anything like what I'm hearing on the bandstand three sets a night. So because I never felt that I was really, my ear wasn't getting my money's worth, I decided to not get over, over involved in the physical reproduction of this music as a home, as a, as a stereo guy, person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, somehow I ran an agent, I ran an Adrian, a, a, a few years ago, and he told me that Herbie, Herbie Hancock had a set, bought a set of his smaller speakers. Yeah. And uh, he thought that I would be interested in hearing them some kind of way. And I said, well, how big are they? And I have a pretty decent sized living room with good ceilings. And he told me, I thought that, well, that size is probably big enough for my house. Why don't you kind of get them over here at some point? So he and his friend came down from Ottawa at some point and, and uh, unpacked these huge crates he brought 606s to you. Wow. Yeah. I said, what did I, what, what did I walk into this time? Because you know, my experience is I've often bought things were much too big for the space. Yeah. Uh, 
And the backstory to that tale is that when I was out to Arizona, Phoenix, doing a, a band clinic, about 20 years ago, I went to a cactus farm. And they have cactus farms out there so people won't steal the cactus from the homeowners, basically. Yeah. So I saw this cactus that said, man, put a great look in my room. So I bought three of them. And I got them to New York, man. They were too big for the elevator. <laughs> but outside in Phoenix, they looked like, the, like, the, they looked like room size to me. So I learned, I learned the hard way, don't do that. <laughs> I thought, until I yep. saw these boxes come up my elevator. I mean, they're, they're wooden crates, man. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, man, is this, are this is this Phoenix revisited? What, what? Now what? Yep. And they unpacked them and put them on these little bitty stands about like this, you know? Yep. And uh, I think at that time I had a, a, a pretty good uh, turntable, a British turntable gear. And uh, he, he, he hooked them up. Because I'm watching this deal, you know, and uh, he seemed like he knew what, what was supposed to go where, so I just stepped back. I got some yeah. coffee and let him take his time. You know, I don't want to make him nervous, looking over his shoulder. Yeah. And uh, we got it hooked up, and I played a Miles Davis record that I was on. I knew that was supposed to sound like. Because yeah. I'm on that record, man. Yeah. I know what that means, you know. And uh, I was kind of stunned because I, I didn't expect, I expected more than I got for the first hour. A week later, I'm, I'm, I'm running back for the work, and so I leave, the, I leave the stuff on the burning and all that kind of stuff like you're supposed to do with good crib. And I come back the next week, and I put the same record on. And I'm a little more tired because I've been working all day. I've been getting you know, stuff. And I sit down in my chair. I call, I call up the captain's chair and play this record. Yeah. And, man, I could see the band walking on the stage. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. That, 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 that became my message to my friends. I said, hey, man. Come by my house and see the band. <laughs> uh, and and uh, they're really, they're just incredible. Uh, I've recorded some classical music as well, you know, with, yeah. and, and a mixture of jazz and classical music. And, and to hear a classical pianist with some jazz drums sounds so clearly different and, and official. So it's quite a, quite a comparison to have to listen to to make a decision. Yeah. And I thought that my choice of writing this music for this band was proof. It worked because I hear on the record. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've, I and I've, I've gone to some audio show shows in the meantime, and uh, of all the things that disappointed me were the sound, were the records that these stereo gear people chose to play for the demonstrating their gear. Yeah, and I've had the audacity to give one of got to take one of my records and listen to it. Because I know what it sounds like, man. Not because I have good gear. I'm on that record. Yeah. No, I mean, you know what you you know what you can expect. I know what it sounds expect. live. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. none of them meant that elementary task to me. So I come back home like this. <laughs> and I sit down, sit in my chair, throw that mouth at his record, and I say, hey, man, come watch the band go on the stage. <laughs> Well, I have to, I have to say my I have a story. It's not quite as expensive, <laughs> but it's similar. it's similar. I mean, I'm a not a musician of your caliber, but I spent many years in a studio and been done a lot of recording. And what I said was I to Adrian. He was driving me to his place to check out the Tetras, and he just said, "I said, you know, I'm I'm looking for a speaker that makes me feel like I was, you know, in the room, and and because I." haven't had the chance to play no, less chance to play uh really good sounding rooms and i wanted i just want to get the feel that i had when i was there and you know tetra to me is the uh I, the thing i usually say is tetra tells the truth i mean you hear what the music is it doesn't color it it doesn't do anything so if you put together like a system that leads to it like the like the Lima monoblocks so that they don't do anything to change the way the music is that's coming to it, then you're hearing exactly what, what it sounded like so much so that I started a column at all about jazz called rediscovery because I was putting on albums I hadn't heard in ages. And it was like, you know, hearing them for the first time because yeah. I never heard them like that. So it's really, they really are remarkable. I actually had a chance to hear the new ones. They're called the 707 Phoenix at that um, Montreal Audio Fest last year. Yeah, um, I was working. I couldn't get up there. How was that? 
uh, pretty staggering. I mean, they, they're slightly larger woofer, they're like a 12-inch woofer instead of the 10s and the 606s, but also they've got uh, this um, uh, a ribbon tweeter rather than the air, mo the air motion transformer that yours have, yeah. and it just takes, it's the same, I mean, it's the same thing, it's just, uh, I don't know how to describe it, because I mean, I, I, it didn't make me want to go out and sell my 333s and buy <laughs> because <laughs> I couldn't afford it but it, but but I but I thought they're like they're a, a, they are a step up from both mine and also a bit from the 606s they are really? a, a, a more present sounding speaker you know I'd love to hear them through my Lima but I don't think he could fit those in my elevator so you know I'd have to say that big no actually they're not they're about the same size, maybe as the six hundred sixes, but they're not quite as tr as like pyramid like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, okay. but they're big enough, and uh, and and they do. Uh, but anyway, but they really did sound uh, everything that uh, I played through them sounded the way I was hoping they would sound, which yeah. is wow. you know, what I'm used to. So I would check them out. I would definitely. I mean, I'm I'm not an audiophile because my definition of an audiophile is a guy who's always looking to uh, find the next best thing. And I'm so happy with my Tetra setup that, you know, I don't have any real interest in upgrading, upgrading. But, you yeah. know, but, but they are, they are a special speaker, the new 707s. Um, anyway, I wanted to also congratulate you on being the recipient of the first Hearth Sound Tetra Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, you've meant, won many awards over your career, of course. Um, but, um, this was, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the specific significance of this award for you. Well, you know, uh, I'm always amazed when I get these pronouncements, these awards, you know. Uh, I'm of a mixed location in the band. I'm always in the back of the band, no matter whose band it is, including mine. Yeah. You know, I'm always in, 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 the, in the back of the band, and the guy in the crook of the piano, you know, the guy who's furthest from the microphone, you know, and, and while I don't play like that, I try to, I play like I'm, I'm, I'm part of the band and when I'm the leader, I, I'm, I want my presence felt musically and physically. Uh, I'm surprised sometimes that people recognize the dichotomy and feel that I'm still worthy of an award. You know, I'm, just, I'm still in the back of the band and they somehow they've, they, they get their, their, they weave their expectations through all the bullshit in front and decide that there's a guy who's on top of his shit. Oh. <laughs> I don't know a better way to put that. Maybe you're amazed, but uh, but uh, but I'm not, because um, uh, I've been a fan of yours since the mid '60s. So you know, this is no surprise to me. But they 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 are talking about uh, the award is for your leadership, mentoring, and teaching. Uh, for one of the greatest sounds ever heard and as a loving and caring human being and world-class musician. So I think that kind of covers a lot of ground. Well, you know, yesterday, I, I, with, with this stuff, with the school closing, I'm doing a lot of lessons. Uh, we all are yeah. online. And I'm kind of learning how to do that. I'm, pretty, I'm behind the curve because I never had to do that before this past three weeks for me. Yeah. And uh, so I had my private lesson. It got a little off the rough start and, and the the last one, I had a lesson yesterday, and uh, after the lesson was over, I sent an email to the student. I said, I tell them, thank you for the lesson. Yeah. Not even thank you for him giving me the lesson. I'm thanking for him giving me the lesson. Yeah. yeah. It, was a whole nother, it was a whole nother experience at this point in the day that stuff that happened in the lesson, how come it didn't occur to me last week? Or this is a better way to do this, or this is another fingering. You know, so I keep teaching because yeah. there's always room to get better doing what I do through teaching. Absolutely. And, and then when I told him this phrase, he was stunned to hear it because he said, I'm just, I'm just a student. Yes, you are just a student. That's your role. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just a teacher. Yeah. The difference is I'm taking lessons from you too. Absolutely. And, I mean, and uh, so yeah. that's one of the reasons I, I teach. I go to work every night, John. Because I'm getting a free lesson from these other three guys, three musicians, including, you know, every night I have to figure out how to make them get better. And is making them getting better, making 
the music first better, and say me, make me better. Because yeah. that's yeah. the end result. Can these guys play better music because I'm playing this certain note for them? If they're not, then it's my shit. They have to figure out how to get the better on my end to make them hear it coming. You know? And, and just just when, when it when it hits the spot, man, and it's happening more and more, it just kind of makes you makes you just feel otherworldly so I can figure it out. Yeah. And a- every night I go to work looking for these spots. And every night I find one or two of them, depending on how my hands feel, how the band feels, stuff that's kind of out of my control. And, and uh, to have these, music, in this case, the quartet, watch me night in and night out. Yeah. And expect me to deliver a, a, a specific level of excellence and a guaranteed attention span person. Yeah. And the guy who's going to be the, the last guy standing and who is accepting my leadership unquestionably. Just an amazing feeling to have when you have these three people night in and night out. Yeah. You know? oh. and, and those are the kind of things I think the people sense when they come here to the band and this award it, it can tell, covers those kind of feelings, those kind of acknowledgements. So I assume foresight is gonna get it. I mean, once this, we're sort of past where we are right now with this pandemic, that, that this is gonna be your ongoing group into the future for the time being? They're all going to be my ongoing group. Yeah. I have a big band that works twice a year with 17 pieces of arrangements. Mm-hmm. I have a trio with Russell Malone and Donald Vega that works from every Still doing Striker, Golden Striker. Okay. Yes. And I have an octet with four cellos and a jazz quartet. Whoa. That, that, that works that. in Japan all the time. I live in the wrong place. I'm not going there. <laughs> Come on, man. Ottawa is a nice place. I'm not going to go there. You know, if you, if you, at some point, John, email me your home address. I'm going to send you a disc of my, me playing uh, uh, classical music, uh, 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 my, my arrangements. Yeah. A famous classical pieces that feed to break off into a wonderful jazz ballad or a court a trio or a waltz or a swing. I'm going to see that record. I'd love to hear that, man. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Thank you.